Yeah, and you still have permission to record, so it should be good. Yeah. Pradeep Guwal, CEO of uh, Solve.care, long time no see. I saw your press release and you have a connection with Link, the, the, the company which just went uh, public with the IPO and which is the, one of the biggest um, sharing companies in, uh, in terms of uh, transport in the United States, 40% market share. What is the relationship between you and healthcare coordination platform on the blockchain and, and Link? How does that work? It's good to see you too, Vincent. It's been a while. Uh, a lot of traveling since we last talked. But this is a very exciting announcement uh, and partnership for Solvecare and for our clients. So Lyft is the, one of the largest ride-sharing companies in the U.S. They are a direct competitor of Uber. Um, and they essentially started with the intention of uh, making transportation accessible to everyone. Huge IPO. Uh, they started off with a valuation of over $25 billion. So it is a big news and around the world, certainly in the US, there's a lot of excitement. Yeah. Um, the, um, the value proposition for transportation and healthcare in this partnership is very, very strong and it has got many dimensions to this. But if you look at the basic value proposition of integrating transportation into healthcare as a part of care delivery, it's this, get the patient to the doctor on time right? Whether it is a uh, transportation related to appointment or it is transportation as an incentive to make an appointment because we will pay for it if you go to get your annual wellness exam done or if it is an appointment related to making sure that care providers can get to the patient mm -hmm. because the patient cannot travel alone and we need to send someone to pick them up and bring them to the physician's office uh, and who pays for it? Who, can, we, can the patient really afford it the day they need to take the, the ride? Uh, if you live in a rural community, are you bound by someone else taking you there if your doctor lives 30 kilometers away or 50 kilometers away? There are many scenarios, whether you're a single working mother without access to your own transportation and you have a limited window in which you can take a doctor and see a doctor, or yeah. you really need to get the, uh, you know, you have three sick kids and you can haul them around. So you're gonna get home care visit happening. Yeah, and so, you have integrated, and you have integrated that in your in the patient app, and the patient app, the patient can uh, create an application, an appointment, and immediately schedule uh, the the transport, and doesn't have to worry about paying in it for at all. So it, it makes completely sense. I thought it was just an original way. It was more than just the basic doctor relationship to patient. That you look a little bit further, and your goal is to have the non-shows uh, to go down and and less administrative costs, I presume. Yeah, so it is more than that. So <clears throat> definitely that's the objective, right? To drive a more accurate and timely uh, and reliable patient-doctor uh, interaction. But the payment model in our system is much more flexible. Yeah. So there is this notion in our whole platform called sponsored care. So Lyft becomes a sponsored benefit. So when you are an insurance company, my former life, and I want to make sure that certain diseases and certain patients see certain doctors and don't miss the appointment, I can incentivize them with a sponsored ride. So the primary objective of our platform is not only can the patient pay for the ride, the doctor can initiate and pay for the ride for the patient, but much more importantly, you as my care circle member, my friend or my coworker or my employer can pay for the ride too. And more importantly, I can have the insurance company bake in, build into my insurance plan rides for certain circumstances and ride for certain conditions. Yeah. So you can say to me, I will give you as a my insurance plan member four rides a year. You can go them to use them to go see a primary care physician or a pediatrician that I've already given you approval list. Don't call me. Yeah. Don't bother asking me for permission. Go. Okay. So it's the idea of delegating authority to the patient without losing control over utilization and baking in transportation, both as an incentive or payment for transportation as a reward, or just facilitating care. Yeah, so I think it's really smart. You basically look at the whole uh, value, to the, all the activities in healthcare, and you try to make every little aspects better and integrate. And I think Link is a nice example of what can, uh, what can be. You are a uh, care coordinating platform, and uh, I think you're now into production, right? Uh, yeah. Where, and I, every time I, 
I, I ask where you are, you're in Korea or you're, you're all over the place. You're in, in Asia, you're in Europe, you're, you're everywhere. Where are now clients in production with the Solve.care platform? So from a true production perspective, our client is the Arizona Care Network and, and they are expanding the network since they launched. So it's been a multi-stage journey. If you remember when we announced the agreement with them, we said this is going to be a three-phase implementation. Mm -hmm. So we launched phase one in 2018. Yep. We are now deep in the middle of launching their phase two in 2019, and they have a, a phase later this yeah. year. How many doctors and how many, cli how many clients are there? In this? So the network consists of about 5,500 doctors and about 300,000 patients. Okay. But the numbers are changing. They are growing as well. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we expect to see more patients in the network. Doctor count doesn't change so dramatically. You don't see new doctors come into an area in thousands a year. You may see a few hundred enter the practice, but into the patient count, we're looking at hundreds of thousands uh, more coming in each year. Okay. So this is a very uh, interesting, but I wanna go back to one more thing from your previous con uh, question. The objective of um, Lyft in SaltCare Wallet is also to use Salt token as the payment currency, as a payment token, and it does not require you or I to have Lyft app on our phone. Mm -hmm. You're doing everything from the wallet yeah. and you're yeah. paying from with the token. Yeah. So what that does is it lets me track how my tokens are being utilized as an issuer of the tokens. If I am, as an insurance company, sending out a million of tokens to 100,000 wallets and expecting them to use it for Lyft, I know exactly who did and did not use uh, and I can revoke or increase the number of tokens in your wallet depending on how good a patient you are. So yeah. it's a fully traceable model of benefit that is very, very hard to do any other way. Yeah, so that's one of the advantages of having your own blockchain uh, currency, which, yeah. um, which, which you can <coughs> organize and also determine and which can be earmarked for all kinds of, uh, for all kinds of particular activities. Okay, so um, that is great. Um, you have your first client, 300,000 people using it. You, I, I, you're working, uh, you're traveling around the world, so I, I guess there's other interest in other countries uh, for your platform? Yeah, so we see a lot of interest coming from pockets. Uh, truly, from a global perspective, we will eventually be everywhere. But right now, the focus is very much on defining opportunities and key partnerships that can help us determine and deliver those opportunities. And where are they now? What are the hottest, uh, what are the three hottest client, uh, countries what you're looking at? So the first is we have had a lot of interest from Asia. So we are entering a partnership in Asia with a company that does a lot of work with insurance companies there. So, uh, and they cover the whole uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, Korea, Japan, and the, and the uh, entire Golden Triangle. So not including Australia, but certainly everything we are on the, uh, in that region. Okay. So in Asia, we, are, we uh, are finalizing that partnership. And I've been there now five times this year. Um, overall between Japan, Korea, Hong Kong, uh, in partnership. We're not going there <clears throat> as SaltCare. We're going there as SaltCare in partnership with the local company. We will announce that partnership um, in the near future. But the point being, you look at a quality partner first. You look at who has access to the right market participants, be it provider networks or insurance companies, and you make sure that they have credibility and you have the scale to bring our platform. And then you sign with them a reseller agreement. But I'm amazed, I'm amazed. I mean, I know that healthcare is very particular and has very <coughs> weird, very weird rules and is very much government dominated or insurance company dominated. Is your platform, is it turning out to be so flexible that it can operate in all these different countries? Are the rules not so different than that you have to do a lot of adaptation to those particular markets? So it was always our goal, if you remember, for every time we met, we spoke that my goal is to build a platform similar to Salesforce, not to build an app. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Pardon me, <coughs> too many weeks on the plane. <coughs> so the, uh, the objective is that by design, we need to be flexible. And by design, we are bringing a relationship-centric model to healthcare versus process model to healthcare. Mm -hmm. So if you think about what does that mean, it means doctor, patient, insurer, employer, family member, relationships, those are human relationships. They don't change so dramatically. They're 80, 90% the same, right? So what changes is who, who carries the risk and who's initiating or who's accepting the transaction. 
But if you build a true peer-to-peer -peer model on blockchain, whether your wallet initiates a transaction to me or I initiate a transaction to you, you know, we can still have the core strength of, uh, of the uh, benefit administration, coordination, and payments using all the capabilities of a distributed ledger. Mm -hmm. So in that regard, we don't find things to be that challenging when we say, let's look at your use case in Hong Kong. How are you dealing with provider payments? Well, you only can have three models. Either insurance company pays for it, or we pay part of it, or the, the patient pays for it, or patient family members pay for it. So mm -hmm. the relationship don't change so dramatically. What changes is the rules. So it is not that we can just lift the care card for Arizona Care Network and give it to you know, Asia Care Network. We can take the care card and say, let's do a fit cap. And if it's 90% the same, what is the cost of the additional 10% variation? Okay. So it becomes very relatively easy. Then our local partners being the domain expertise. So our vision is not to have solved care buildings everywhere around the world, right? Okay. So we have to have domain experts. Okay. So therefore, we are, we are being very successful in bringing it to different market, but it's not a zero friction growth. You have to invest in each market. Yeah, partners, et cetera. Good question. Dealing with the blockchain and doing operations on the platform and doing a, a bunch of, uh, lots of transactions on the, on the blockchain. And you have, one is your currency, which you did in your ICO. And the other one is the currency you use inside the network, which is more you know, per client. How are your experience with that, the, the quality of the software and the, and the tools which are available and the stability of the blockchain and the usable usability of the blockchain as a, um, as a, as a money uh, transaction uh, network? So look, there are definitely limitations, right? The blockchain technology evolves and is evolving and will continue to do so. We are not counting on blockchain as the sole enabling technology. We have the platform uses blockchain as a key layer, as a ledger, uh, and we call it the event ledger and the care ledger um, and the relationship ledger. So we use blockchain in many ways, but we use it to drive a very core value, decentralized ledger across all the wallet holders. But beyond that, we do have to build a lot of functionality into it. You're not relying yeah. on blockchain to do everything. No, and no, you know, we have a very let's, large let's assume that that's the same. I just wanted to ask you because initially we got, in, you know, this is much bigger than blockchain. Blockchain is just a tool. But I just am interested because our people, the, the people who are in my conference and in my network, they're really interested. If you do production with a blockchain, what kind of problems do you come in? You also have a you have a relational database, and there's lots of things, and nothing is really not, nothing of size is stored in the blockchain. But I just want to ask you, what is your experience with the technology of the blockchain? Does it hold you back? Is it a lot of extra work compared to an compared to a normal database, is, is the price you have to pay uh, worth it to, to use Absolutely. this blockchain? The, the, there's no doubt. I mean, we have not regretted our decision to use blockchain as the key fabric on which we are doing this. But the fundamental reason that I can create and publish a fabric as a client of SolveCare, that can be independently audited by anyone, big five or, you know, a you know, kid in a garage. I don't have to continuously prove to you that I'm not misusing your data as a patient or as a doctor. My ability to delegate authority, my ability to decentralize processes, sure I could theoretically do it as a centralized database, but you would have to trust my word that I'm not doing something behind the scenes that you're oh, invisible. And people, because I mean, you talk to doctors, you talk, talk to hospitals, you talk to care networks. Right. Do, they have no idea about blockchain, right? I mean, they've heard about it, but do they trust you more because you have the blockchain on certain layers of your solution is that really does that it does it make it, are the people who the accountants who verify the it systems do they have more trust in the fact that there's a blockchain somewhere in your system i think they trust the architecture very well once they understand it it's not something that you walk in and say hey i'm a blockchain company and they go wonderful come on in <laughs> but what they do say is okay i'm intrigued as to what you claim your platform can do and I know that you use blockchain in some very creative ways. What is this, how, the first question always is, why do you even need a blockchain, right, always. Mm -hmm. in, uh, in one big, uh, just as an anecdote, I was in Italy recently in one of the massive towers in Milan of, a, of the major insurer. So in the top floor in this very imposing building, you're sitting in the boardroom and their CIO walks in and goes, heard a lot about you guys. Yeah. What do you use blockchain for? Why can't you do this without blockchain? I said to him, I said, you have this massive tower in the heart of Milan. Do you think this was built because blockchain existed when you started the company? You have existed for hundreds of years. So the world existed before blockchain. 
But obviously, we bring value that you need to understand. But if you ask me, do I need to do I need a blockchain to live and exist? No, you don't, and neither do I. But we will make things better for you. Mm. And then over the course of the next four hours, it was supposed to be an hour meeting, lasted more than four. It was like, okay, now I get it. You are essentially giving me the two tools of a new model of relationships between patient, provider, me, my network, and so on. And then it becomes a question of use cases. Show me the care cards. What care cards are you transacting sure. on? And then, and then you get into normal functionality. But I'm just interested in the in the tool. So it isn't it isn't it isn't it isn't point of interest to talk about. It can help you to get into the door. It can help you to get more trust. And then the price you have to pay by using blockchain uh, are the tools getting better? Is the amount of transactions uh, is that enough? Are you already there? What what blockchain are you using currently? So we're using Ethereum Enterprise, and we have had no performance issues that have been so that cannot be overcome. Right. Yeah. So we haven't. Let's look at it this way. We haven't had one conversation with Arizona Care Network that the chain isn't operating as designed. Not one. We've had conversations about can you make the wallet you know, more powerful, easier to use? Can you give me more care cards? But the conversation about blockchain has been, you guys have done a good job, the fabric works, I can get it out to the vault. Now, the question here is, can we improve it? Absolutely. And Avadim, our CTO does that every day. He's always in my office saying, I wanna tweak this, and I wanna add this module, I wanna hang this endpoint off the chain. Fine, we're yeah. never gonna stop working, but is the blockchain perfect now? Is it adequate for today, even in a high transaction, high complexity model that we are? Mm -hmm. We have a very complex fabric in which blockchain serves its purpose. Could we, would we want to see it do more? Yeah, but it's not blocking us today. And it's, and the, the, and the whole uh, e ecosystem is developing fast enough. There's, there's 5,000 people working on, developers working on, uh, on Ethereum and on the enterprise side, there's a whole bunch of people. Is, is the speed of which is improving, uh, you know, enough to satisfy your needs? Um, I think overall the eco, eco model is growing it faster than we originally anticipated, but it's not growing fast enough from a business perspective, right? Mm. And I think that there are more organizations who need to collaborate um, and work with each other to drive more business value. We hear a lot about core intrinsic blockchain, you know, pieces coming out, some of the technologies I don't even understand, and it's about shards and multi shards and things like this, great. But when I try to translate them to use cases, I find that there has not been much thought. So we are having, and we had last year several conversations with these large organizations that are feeding the core infrastructure, you know, be it consensus or others, and had very meaningful discussion with them saying, here are the use cases that I will bring to market when you're, when not your, when our blockchain can do more things. But again, we compensate. We just build into our platform what sure. the blockchain doesn't do. Okay. Hey, last question. Um, the amount, the, 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 the ICO you did with Ethereum, you basically raised 25 million that went down, of course, uh, a bunch. Uh, how are you doing in terms of profit and cash flow? Do you have enough uh, to, uh, to survive for the next year? Yeah, we are fine in terms of this year. Um, from a core operations perspective, we have both a combination of reserves we raised during the ICO and the revenue. But as we look towards some acquisitions and growth that is coming our way, and as I said, you know, we're growing faster than we had originally planned and we need to be very careful we don't overgrow ourselves. We are going to do an equity round. Uh, we'll launch an equity round in the next few weeks with the help of a professional investment banker. And we will go to market with a very traditional uh, investment banking You're round. Selling but shares. You're selling shares. And are you selling shares uh, in the STO way, so the secure token, so that a token is a share? Or are you using the old-fashioned uh, the old-fashioned uh, investment uh, banker's way? Uh, they're both on the table. So we are not experts enough to say if SDOs are the right tool. I mean, here's the thing. We plan to go public in the next you know, foreseeable future, not tomorrow, not in a year, but certainly in that five-year window. And everything that I'm doing today, I have an eye on compliance and, and achieving a public listing on a major stock exchange. So I don't want to do anything that can cause eyebrows to be raised later on to say, well, we can't take you on our board in you know, wherever it is, Hong Kong or, or New York and build a barrier to that. But having said that, the reason we hired a top tier firm is we said, okay, help us navigate. Where is the, the ball today and where is the ball going to be in three to five years? And let's keep our eye on the long price, which is to take this company to a sustainable public offering. So I think SDO is only on the table as long as it does not 
uh, bar us from going to public in the future, right? If I take a step today and it won't let me go public in three years, I'm not going to do that. Yeah, but there's going to be many different kinds of publics. You know, there's going to be publics uh, on, on the modern way, the old way, but yes. it's, uh, I, I, it's been very interesting what you said. Okay, good, Pradeep. Thank you very much. Link is very great. Nice to see that uh, the production is going well, that you have a lot of clients around the world, and it was also very interesting about the future that you're using an old-fashioned, very respectable company to do in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, a new around we're going to see that uh, we're going to look at uh, the next meeting. We shouldn't wait so long anymore to talk because, I mean, I want to have a regular update on this. But uh, great to see you doing well, and thank you for your time. I'll see you in June. Thanks very much.